Rob, guys and, and gals for joining us today. We do have a full slate. Um, we started putting this topic together. I didn't realize how much content um, we had accumulated through our research, and I'm super excited to be able to share it with you today. So without further ado, let's go ahead and dig in. All right, so let's start off by talking about what is credit risk. And credit risk is the risk that about a borrower or a customer will fail to make the required payments. We all know this, right? Um, it's primarily the risk on the lender that includes lost principal interest, disruption to cash flow, and increased collection costs. So there's a lot that goes into credit risk, and most companies, especially small companies, really don't know how to manage it. Credit risk management is the lender's primary line of defense to protect itself against customers who fail to meet the terms of the credit that was extended to them. Credit risk management is an important aspect to ensure that a company will not take more risk than it can handle. And we're going to talk about all the things that go into credit risk management, as well as maybe giving you some things that you haven't thought of yet. Um, we take maybe a, a little more modern approach to, uh, to credit limits and credit terms, and we don't believe that all bad debt is necessarily all that bad. So hopefully you'll get a couple little pointers here today. So why bother with credit management? just want to highlight this. We all know this is true. The longer that an invoice goes unpaid, the less likely that we will ever be paid on that invoice. If you have invoices out there, 39% of them are probably paid late. 17% of your customers are not adhering to credit terms, 48% of customers are delaying payment, and 52% of your businesses are asking for extended payment terms. What this all boils down to is that our day sales outstanding across all industries is about 61 days on net 28 terms. So it's taking your customers more than twice their agreed upon credit terms to make a payment which is simply, in my, in my mind, unacceptable. So let's talk about the pros of extending uh, credit to customers. Why do we extend credit to our customers? We do it because it increases the amount of money they're willing to spend with us, especially when they have cash flow issues themselves. It establishes trust with our customers, customer loyalty, enhances our reputation, maybe gives us a competitive edge. You know, if our competitors are extending terms and we're not, um, it may be a little more difficult to do business with us. And it can help us increase our customer base. And there's a lot of other pros to extending credit. But with any pro, there's also a con. When we extend credit, we're basically taking the position of a bank. We are financing or floating our customers. And we have a lot of risk that's involved here. We could offer credit to the wrong customer. If we extend credit and they take too long to pay, we're having a dramatic and negative impact on our cash flow. We're increasing our need to be effective in managing our receivables. And let's face it, you know, collecting on past due accounts receivable costs something. We have to pay somebody to follow up on it. We have to put systems in place to help us get organized. You know, everything that we do is an added cost. So extending credit isn't free, not to your business, not to any business. But the pros do outweigh the cons if you can manage them using a system that is built on best practices to help you identify potential risk, eliminate it, or reduce it so that you continue to extend credit and monitor it effectively going forward. This presentation, um, I just want to mention, we'll be going through the different slides. We have a new release of our product, Anytime Collect 2015, which is um, scheduled for release in the next couple of weeks. We have a lot of new functionality in this product around credit management. And we do have um, a pre-release guide that is available. So if at the end of the presentation you're interested, um, we can share the release guide, let you know what's coming in that next release. Okay. So we're going to talk about um, actually 12 steps here, 12 different things that we need to focus on when it comes to credit management. The first, and I am, I've been preaching this for quite some time, is that you need to develop a credit policy. The credit policy basically is your document that defines 
how you extend credit to customers, you know, what types of terms, credit limits, roles and responsibilities within the organization, you know, who can um, extend credit, who can change credit, um, who follows up on, you know, the bad debt. How do you handle bad debt? Do you factor it? Do you send it to a third-party collection agency? Uh, do you utilize, um, you know, a legal firm for your uh, demand letters? The goal of a credit policy is really to define the whole process so that you can go back time and time again and repeat what your corporate objectives are. Okay? We do have a, a white paper that is available. It's called Six Steps to Developing a World Class business credit policy and collection action plan. Incredibly helpful um, for anybody that does not have a credit policy in place today. The, the process of creating the credit policy, there's, there's several steps to it. The first is really to do your homework. You need to find out where you're at today. Uh, find out how you benchmark against your competitors. Talk to your customers. And there's a whole lot of things you need to do up front. And once you understand where you're at and who you're serving and what your needs are and where you're failing, maybe where you're having successes, the next thing then is to really set some business goals. You know, if my DSO today is at 60, what can I do to get down to 45 or down to 40? You know, what are my goals for this uh, credit and collections action plan? Because if you don't have goals, there's no sense in even having one. The next step once you have all that in place is to really look at who you have within your organization um, that's going to be part of this team. And this isn't just your accounts receivable department. This is everybody from accounts receivable, CFO, controllers, on up into sales. You know, your sales is really an extension of your credit department. So you need to take a look at all the resources, find out who's there, define what responsibilities they have, and then, you know, in some cases, you're going to find that you're missing pieces. Go and get another resource internally. Or you may have good resources, but they don't have the tools that they need to be effective. So you need to look at systems. You need to look at call scripts or email templates. Um, you may need to look at training. So there's a lot of things that go into developing that team. Now, once you're halfway through here, now it's time to really enact the credit policy and, and, and collection action plan. You're going to fine-tune those procedures. You're going to start to, to see things that maybe you didn't see before. You know, maybe I need to call customers earlier in the process, or maybe it's only a subset of my customers. Maybe if I take different uh, strategies, um, different messages with certain types of customers, it'll help me uh, get paid faster or reduce disputes. The last step there, um, the next to last step is implementing a system. Uh, we, you know, obviously develop uh, anytime collect. We, we believe wholeheartedly in the application, but you don't have to use our application. There are some things that you can do in a manual system, um, but having a system where all of this information is uh, centralized and where you can have automation and implement best practices uh, certainly goes a long way. And then the absolute last step in this uh, credit policy process is continuous improvement. You're never done. Um, you know, businesses never cease to change. You're going to bring on different customers, different products or services. Uh, you're going to grow. You're going to morph as a, as a business. And you should always be looking at ways to improve your processes. Interesting note here, the Credit Research Foundation estimated that about 20% of credit departments have a formalized uh, credit policy. I would argue that number is, um, is actually uh, much lower. We work with a lot of small and mid-sized companies that the Credit Research Foundation doesn't even work with. And, and I'd be surprised if maybe 5% of the companies we work with have a credit policy. And it doesn't have to be anything um, you know, too glamorous, but at least you know, have something documented on how you extend credit, who's part of the team, you know, and what policies and procedures you have in place. So the credit policy is the foundation for everything we're going to talk about today. You know, what is the objectives? Who's, the, who's responsible? You know, roles, responsibilities. What's the credit approval process? Credit limits, credit terms. How are you going to monitor this going forward? And how do you respond when you have a bad debt situation? You know, these are all things we're going to talk about throughout the presentation today. One note here, and this one's very important, there is no need to develop a credit policy or a collection plan 
if you are not 100% behind it. Everybody within your organization needs to be on board with this. This needs to be a corporate initiative. It needs to have a corporate sponsor backing it up. It cannot sit on a shelf collecting dust. You're going to spend a lot of time doing your research to get up to this point, and I, I just really can't tell you um, how important it is to make sure that this doesn't fall by the wayside with other initiatives or, the, you know, the busier you get. Um, this is something that can be very impactful on your business and um, a very good resource for you going forward. So just a couple things that we do within our product. Um, you can see on the screen here that we have a number of different um, steps that happen in the collection process. So, you know, credit policies and procedures. You know, what do we do when customers have invoices due in the next five days and there's a balance due? Chances are you're not doing anything. It's a best practice. You want to have a system that can send them an automated email with a copy of the invoices that are coming due. Nice little friendly reminder, you need to pay your bills. What do you do after that? You know, five days past due, I want the collector to make the first call. At 10 days past due, I want to send a past due notice. At uh, 15 days past due, I want the collector to make a, a second a call. And define what that process looks like. These are things that we can do within our software. You don't have to run off of an aging report with your variety pack of highlighters and 15 Excel spreadsheets moving in and out of your accounting software in Excel. Um, you know, we bring it all together. We're going to create these rules, these best practices, and then give you a work list notifying you what you need to do, when, and why with everything you need right at your fingertips. We've also, with the new release, added um, what we call activity procedures. And these can be used for a number of different things. Um, the example I have on the screen here is if I'm, you know, I, I add another a new customer to my um, my Sage ERP system, my Apple Core ERP system. We sync that data into Anytime Collect. We want the collector to make an introductory phone call with that new customer, review your credit policies, procedures, start to build a relationship with them. Uh, relationships are really important. Review that first-time invoice. Make sure there's no problems with it. You know, nine times out of ten, if you have a problem with an invoice, it's going to be the first time that you send an invoice to a customer. But these procedures are then available to your collectors. So when they get an activity in their to-do list to make that first uh, introductory call, these procedure notes basically tell them what do they need to do on that call. And we get set of procedures for all kinds of different things. You know, what do you do, what's your procedure if you find out the uh, company's being acquired or they're going bankrupt or they're asking for payment plans or um, extended payment terms or credit limits. You can define your corporate procedures in these notes. So really, really cool. Our customers have been asking for this for a while. Credit applications. Credit applications most companies don't use and the information they collect they don't follow up on. A business, business credit application is useful because it will help you, if you use it right, identify companies that may be a little riskier. Okay? There's a number of things that um, should be included on that. Um, you're going to want to ask for you know, bank references, trade references. Um, you're going to want to ask about maybe their financials, assets, liabilities, profit loss. Um, you know, lots of information you want to collect on a business, business credit application, which can be used for new customers, but we also recommend you use it for your existing customers. Anytime a, a customer is asking for a change in their credit terms or credit limit, have them update this application so you have the most relevant information on hand. Best practice, um, you know, we've all done it before. We send out the, uh, the business credit app, people fill it out, they send it back and then we don't follow up on it. Always call the trade references. Lots of things you need to ask them. You know, is there a, a pattern of paying some suppliers on time and some late? Why? Is it seasonal? Is there a chronic delinquency or is there sporadic patterns, seasonal patterns? Is a poor payment history due to employment issues, a one-time event, change in marital status? You know, the personal things that are affecting uh, that potential customer. You know, what are the customer's anticipated monthly purchases? I mean, all these things we need to be asking them. Who are their customers? Who are their competitors? 
Have they had any bad checks? Do they order and or pay consistently? These are fair questions to ask any new customer to gauge whether they're credit worthy. And some things that we've added with the new version, um, one is we've added um, a document management solution within the product. So you know, everybody has different business credit application forms. Why not use Word? It works really well. So you create your business credit application template. You put it out into a directory. Um, you can then send that out to your customers. They can fill it out. They can email it back. It's all stored within the software. Or they could even, if they wanted to, go out and upload it to a customer portal. Um, and what I'm showing on this screen here is in the back we have an email that we've crafted uh, sending out to one of our customers. And what it includes, if you look here, um, this little kind of funky code here, this is going to send the customer a unique encrypted link. And when they click on that hyperlink, which is the... Uh, email that they've received over here to view documents. They'll click that view documents um, hyperlink, takes them out to the um, Anytime Collect portal, and there they can view the documents that are in their external file. So they can view business credit applications, references, they can upload any of the information that you need. Um, you know, it could be used for all kinds of different things. You can even expose to them you know, invoices, proof of delivery, timesheets, things that would be related um, specifically even to invoices. Okay, so that's something new in the software. Credit scoring, um, everybody does this different as well, but it is generally a method of evaluating the credit worthiness of your customers using some sort of formula, right? Um, most of us don't get that sophisticated. We're going out to DNB or Experian and pulling a credit report and seeing what information's on there and what that credit score is. And there's, there's two kind of ways to, to look at credit scoring. One is more judgmental and one is more statistical. You know, on the judgmental side, we're looking at, you know, their payment history. Do they have a tendency to be late? Um, you know, what was the feedback we got from the bank or the trade references? Um, we can look at the reports from the credit agencies. We can look at financial statement ratios, and we can analyze this to the nth degree. Statistical model, we could build these out based on you know, the data we're getting from the, uh, the credit bureaus, or we could use maybe some of our own data, which is probably more accurate for an existing account. Some best practices in, in uh, credit scoring. You need to kind of figure out what strategy is going to match your corporate object objective objectives. Um, you need to keep accounts receivable information up to date and organized. You need to focus on creating efficiencies. We don't want to create more work. We want to create less work. Um, but sometimes this does require you know, a little bit of effort. We need to review our customers' credit often because it will change. And we need to use data from as many sources as possible. And this we all know this, right? If you're going to try to do some statistical analysis, the more data points you have, the more accurate the results will be. So some things we've added within um, Anytime Collect, uh, the, the new version for 2015. On the bottom, you can see in our site options, we've added the ability to define credit scores for up to three different credit bureaus. So if you are pulling reports from you know, TransUnion, Experian, down to Brad Street, or others, you can define which bureaus you pull those reports from, and then for each customer, you can track their individual credit scores. On the bottom, we also have a way to, um, to rank these customers, and we even have color coding. You can see the little highlight on Abbott Consulting. When you're looking at a customer account with an Anytime Collect, this will be a visual cue of the, uh, the credit risk associated with that account. So these are some things that we've added that I think are going to be really, really helpful going forward. Um, the other thing to consider is that credit reports can cost anywhere between $40 and $1,500 per report. So you're not going to be pulling them for every customer. Um, the more information that you can do with your own data, um, you know, the better off you're going to be from a cost standpoint. Um, this is the, the new customer info tab with the new release as well. And if you look over on the right, 
Um, we can see that we have the date of the last credit review. We can see the credit score. Um, that's our internal credit score, the TransUnion, the Experian. If we were to done a Bradstreet one, we'd see that there as well. You know, days past due, credit limit, available credit, highest balance. Um, you see the cost of credit, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit. So lots of information about your customer's credit available right at your fingertips. Good data, the, terror, the terrors of dirty data. Kind of looks like a psycho film here. Too many times we work with companies, they're using spreadsheets, um, everything's outdated, it's, um, it's not accurate, there's miskeyed information. The key to managing credit and collections effectively is to have up-to-date information that is accurate because you're making some uh, pretty important decisions with your customers. Now, on the business credit side, there's, there's very little statistics out there on how accurate business credit reports are. I've seen some, and quite frankly, I'm not impressed with any of them. Um, it, they may be somewhat helpful to identify a potential deadbeat, but you know most companies are going to rank fairly high, and you're not going to get a whole lot out of those credit reports. I'm sure many of you on the, the call today would probably agree with that. So what I did find for statistics, um, I think is a good correlation. On the consumer side, one in five Americans have an error on the credit report. That's a 20% error rate. What is that error rate on the business credit side? I'm expecting that it's at least 20%. So again, we're trying to talk about getting good data. If we're relying solely on uh, credit reporting agencies for that information, there's a good chance that um, we have some bad data that we're, we're working with here. Keep in mind, credit scoring for business customers is not as precise as credit scoring for consumers because the amount of information varies. It varies uh, depending on you know, the size of the company, smaller companies, less established companies. You know, credit bureaus may not even know who the heck they are. You get into a large organization, you know, General Electric, uh, General Motors. Those companies, obviously, there's there's data on them. But you have some small consulting firm that starts up, or a small e-commerce uh, company or distributor. You you'll be hard pressed to find good information. So, what factors impact uh, the credit report accuracy? It's, number one is where is it coming from. You know, the bigger the, the credit agency, um, oftentimes the more accurate the data. Not always true, but Experian, and Brad Street, TransUnion are pretty credible. Um, there are some industry credit bureaus out there. Um, I know of one, I think they're based out of Canada, the Food Industry Credit Bureau, and uh, they focus specifically on an industry. So you're going to want to look at your options on where you can get these types of reports. Um, there's another one, I can't remember their name offhand, um, but they special, specialize in uh, credit reports for very small companies. Um, they have a lot of information on, I think, it's the under 100 employee uh, market. We're done in Bradstreet. Some of the bigger boys don't have that type of information. How often is the uh, information updated? Um, that's another factor we're going to look at. Um, are, they just, are they receiving the right information? This is a quote from the VP of Product Management from Experian. We're just reporting what's being reported to us. Doesn't give me a lot of confidence there. And then the other thing to consider is, is the information inherently flawed? If you're a smaller company, don't you think that a larger company may take longer to pay you? I mean, I've seen this. We've worked with hundreds of companies. The small guys dealing with the big guys, the big guys are, you know, as customers are going to say, you know what? We'll pay you when we feel like paying you, but if you want us as a customer, you're going to deal with it. You know, credit agencies are, are getting more data from large companies. They're not getting that information from the small companies. And, you know, this all has problems with the accuracy of the information that we're, uh, we're trying to build our business on. As far as getting updated information, we do synchronize with your uh, ERP or accounting application. We're pulling all that data down. You know, open accounts receivable, updated customer information, contact information, uh, payments, payment applications. 
all that information we're synchronizing into our application. We're putting a dashboard together to give you that up-to-date, timely information that you so desperately need to be able to make some of these decisions. You know, down to um, all of your accounts. You know, you can view agings. You can see when they were established, their status, their credit limits, available credit. All that information we're pulling in and putting front and center so that you have that information available uh, when you're making your collection calls and trying to make credit decisions. Credit limits. The goal for establishing credit limits is not to prevent customers from buying more, but rather to limit your risk. Good customers with established credit should have more access to credit to buy more products and services. Makes sense. We need to review customer credit scores and risk often and reevaluate credit limits frequently. Based on those reviews, we need to increase or decrease credit limits as customer credit scores and other factors dictate. Again, all makes sense. I've seen um, some companies where they set up a customer, bring a new account. You know, we don't really have established credit with, with them, so we're going to give them a you know small credit limit. Maybe it's ten thousand dollars. They continually pay on time. Well, what happens is in six months or a year after twenty or thirty orders and them paying on time all the time, they're buying to the max of their credit limit. What's happening? If they need to buy more, maybe they need to buy $50,000 from you every month. They're probably going to your, your competitors because you haven't given them enough credit. So you need to evaluate the credit limits, especially for very good customers, to make sure you're not throttling them back. Um, credit limit calculations, there's a couple ways to, uh, to figure out how much credit to extend. Um, the top is kind of a industry standard, if you will. I'm not a big fan of it, but you know, if you can get your hands on this information, you can look at their assets minus their liabilities and divide by 10. I don't know why 10 is the number they use, but that's kind of a standard out there. Um, you can also look at the tra trade reference considerations called the, uh, the other vendors for those customers. Find out what kind of credit they've extended. Um, you may want to offer something similar, especially if you've had a really good experience. And then needs. You know, ask your customer. You know, how much credit are you looking for? You know, instead of having some set policy where new customers only get a certain amount, ask them. You know, they might surprise you. They might say, you know, I don't need that much, or maybe I need more. I, you know, I really plan on buying a lot of products. As long as you provide great products and services, I'll buy everything from you. So you really need to take a look at um, all the factors um, that go into that decision on how much credit to extend. Um, we have um, some other stuff in the software. We have um, account details, so you can look at all the details on your customers. And more importantly, I can see you know, with the customer info tab that pops down. You know, what are the average number of days that it takes this customer to pay me? And then I can actually look at that based on the size of the invoice. I can look from a history perspective, how many times have they broken a promise or had a dispute from 90 days back to two years, and what's their current aging. This, again, is all important information that I'm going to want um, when I'm making a determination to increase or decrease a credit limit. Credit terms. I get asked this all the time, what should my terms be? I really don't know. My competitors are offering net 30. Do I have to offer net 30? Do I offer it to everyone? I don't know. So a couple of tips here. What are your competitors doing? You do need to know that. If the industry average is you know, food and beverage, distribution, manufacturing is probably around net 10, um, you probably want to offer something like that. But you may want to consider offering net 20. If you can afford it and it's not going to cause any problems, that might give you a competitive advantage. Can you afford to require a prepayment if you have better products or services? If you're looking at cash flow management yourself, obviously the faster we get paid, the better it is on our cash flow. If we have a superior product or service, especially in a monopoly or a particular industry or market, maybe we don't have to extend credit terms. Maybe we can require a prepayment. If that's the case, you should do it. Do you have cash flow issues? Um, if you're experiencing cash flow problems, maybe forecasting cash is very difficult. You may want to reduce your terms slightly, go from a net 30 to a net 20. 
take that down 10 days, that should have an impact. Um, you may even want to look at this based on the type of account. Maybe smaller, newer accounts, you want to have smaller terms. Maybe you offer them net 10 or net 15. You know, we've certainly done that with some of our customers until they have established credit with us. Consider discounting. I love this strategy. Uh, two, you know, 210 net 30. I'll give you a 2% discount if you pay it in 10 days. Otherwise, it's a full amount in net 30. I'd go a step further. And I would add a penalty on that. So if you pay after 30 days, you get a 2% penalty. You know, why not spell that out for them, give them more incentive to pay you up front? And you have to remember that extending credit is a privilege. We don't have to extend credit to our customers. And we should take that away if there's customers that are abusing it. Some other thoughts and considerations. Could we sell more if we offered more creative terms? I'll give you an example of this. I've been in sales in the past. I'm trying to sell a company and you know they don't have the cash flow to make a big purchase. Let's do some creative terms here. You know, it's a hundred thousand dollar purchase. Can you afford to give me fifty thousand now? And maybe give me the you know the other fifty percent in sixty days? So we can get creative with credit terms down to the invoice level. We can also consider offering special extended terms on perishable time, obviously products or low demand items. I want to give you some examples of this. What if you have a service company? You know, our business is very similar to this. We have consultants, right? And we, they bill time. Well, what happens if we don't have enough work for those consultants? That time goes away. It's a perishable asset. If my billable rate is $100 per hour, I'm basically throwing that away every hour. My consultant is sitting on the bench not doing anything. But what if I went to one of my customers, I know that they don't have you know, a lot of cash right now, there's some projects they might be looking at, and I go to them and say, you know what, it's your lucky day. You sign off this week, $75 an hour, you know that 40 hour project that you were looking at, we'll do it for that rate, special offer. You might as well make something rather than throw that all away. Another example, transportation company, trucking company. They have a haul, it's a paid haul, they go make the delivery. What are they doing on the way back? They're bringing back an empty truck. Maybe they can't find a load to get them even close to being back home. Well, you know, let's say that it costs $10,000 to do a haul. Maybe you find a, a company locally and you try to undercut your competitor and you do it for half that price, $5,000. Are you making money on the haul? No, not really. But you're making $5,000 than you would have than bringing that truck back empty. Distributor. You have a product that's going to be obsolete. You know it's going to be obsolete. Your supplier is giving you a new version of the product. Or you've made an engineering change if you're a manufacturer. Let's blow that inventory out, right? You know, this is pretty common stuff. The other thing that that does, it reduces our carrying costs. So lots of considerations around things that, you know, you don't normally think about when it comes to, to credit collections. Another tip, micromanage accounts as needed. Most customers want to pay you on time. Um, we'll talk about why they don't later. If you have a customer that continually pays 15 days late and you offer net 30 terms, that means you're getting paid in 45 days. If you really want to get paid in 15 days, or I'm sorry, in 30 days, reduce their terms to net 15 and see what happens. If they're always going to pay you 15 days late, they might actually pay you when you hope to get paid, which is net 30. Uh, be creative, offer financing, layaways, other options for riskier accounts. You know, these are your customers. If you want to do business with them, find a way that you know, is mutually agreeable, agreeable and uh, beneficial for both of you. And then you know, on the flip side, you know, if you're experiencing cash flow issues, consider asking your vendors for extended terms. Can you imagine how nice it would be if you could extend 30-day terms to your customers to get 60-day terms from your vendors? I mean, you'd be positive cash flow, at least you should be. And then the last tip here, if you have a deadbeat, put them on a credit hold. Don't remove the credit hold until they pay. Charge them late fees, and when they come back, because they will come back hopefully, eventually, stick to your guns and charge them that late fee so they learn a lesson. Yeah, I've got kids, and all of you on the call today, you know if you're not strict, you, you don't do what you say and, and say what you do, um, they're going to continue to use and abuse you. If we say net 30, it needs to be net 30, not pay us when you feel like it. Monitoring credit. 
Today we have good customers, but guess what? Good customers can turn bad. We had a, a case of that a couple of years ago before we were using our software. Great customer building a lot of work through them. They, they paid late, but they usually paid us. You know, eventually wasn't too bad. And then one day we got um, a notice that uh, they were out of business. And uh, we, were, we were left with a pretty sizable write-off. So, and we saw, you know, we saw the, uh, the trending. You know, they started to pay later and later. They started to dispute more things. They promised to pay. They'd break them. We just didn't have a way at that point in time to track it. Um, we hadn't developed any time collect. So you really need to monitor your customers, even your good customers. And then you may have bad customers, right? Customers that, you know, they're not looking so good. Maybe you're about ready to pull the plug, but all of a sudden something happens. They land some big account. They get acquired. And all of a sudden, you know, they turn into one of your better customers. You need to reevaluate these things because they change. Do you have the data to understand what's happening? You probably do. But can you analyze every account in detail? Probably not without a system. What do you need to, to be looking at? What are the, the triggers that kind of affect our decisions in credit? You know, is there an increase in the amount of days that are late, increases in disputes or broken promises? And there's a whole lot of other things that we really need to pay attention to. Best practice, every single account you have, you should be doing a business credit review. Customers that are maybe less established, um, you may want to review them more frequently than that, potentially quarterly. Use a system to alert you to changes in customer behavior, good and bad. I have customers that are you know, starting to turn around. I want to talk to them, extend more credit. Customers that are bad, I want to you know, rein them in a little bit. Check the credit worthiness regularly. Run your credit checks on customers who represent anything over 5 to 10%. This is another way if you can't touch them all. You know, most companies, 80% of your revenue comes from 20% of your customers. Probably the same thing with your bad debt um, or late payments. Probably 80% of them come from 20% of your accounts. Let's, let's manage it that way, right? Filter that information down instead of calling um, 1,000 customers. I only have to call my top 200. And that should help me alleviate 80% of my risk. Cost of credit is something that um, we've added into our software. When we extend business credit, we're no different than a bank extending a loan. The customer who pays beyond their credit limit is costing us money. If we had to go out to a financial institution, a bank, and borrow money, they're not going to give that to us for free. Why are we giving that to our customers for free? Because it's a common courtesy, right? You know, what would a bank charge us? Six, eight, ten percent interest rate? We're a business. We're not a bank. We, you know, we don't want to get paid in 60 days if they have net 30 terms. If we wanted to get paid in 60 days, we'd give them net 60 terms. Cost of credit allows us to identify what is the cost of this customer beyond their agreed upon credit terms? And what we do, and we show this right on our dashboard, is we look at our top 10 customers using this very simple calculation. You define the APR if you went to your bank and say, hey, I want a loan for $10,000, 6, 8, 9, 10%. We multiply that times the amount past due and the amount of days past due across all the invoices. Let me tell you which customers are costing you the most above and beyond their agreed upon credit terms. So something pretty cool and unique to the product. We can also set up uh, credit alert, alerts within the software, um, things that you would never be able to do manually. Maybe we want an alert to, co to go out to the, uh, the collector or the CFO or the controller any time that a customer breaks a promise to pay more than three times in six months. Maybe we want an alert to go out and notify us every time that a customer has three or more disputes in the past six months. Maybe we want an alert to basically notify us that you know, we haven't done a full credit review with this customer in the past year. Their average days late is now growing to greater than X percent or X number of days. Maybe it's 15 or 30 days. Their cost of credit is increasing over a certain amount. You know, they're on credit hold in the, in the accounting system. We want an alert to basically queue those up so we can see everybody that's on credit hold. And we can create a lot of more complex alerts. You can base it off of any of the data in your system, whether that's um, account level information or invoice level information. Communicate 
Uh, most customers aren't beating down your door to pay you. You need to communicate with them. You need the accurate information, timely. You need to be persistent. Remember, it's not collections. It's actually cash forecasting. You provided the product or service to your customer on good faith. Unless there was a problem with it, they should pay you on time. You need to document what you've done. You need to talk to the right people. You need to resolve disputes. Use best-in-class uh, templates, call scripts, and emails. And you know what? Be nice. A lot of times being kind goes a long way. We always say people buy from people they like. Well, people pay people they like. If you call and you are, uh, are not very friendly and not willing to work with the customer, your invoice is probably going to the bottom of the pile. They're not going to jump to make a payment. And we do have um, a document that's available for you, how to develop killer AR collection letter, um, call scripts, and email templates, another resource for you. So just a communication screen within our software where you can document what you've done, make phone calls, send emails, record expected payments, and manage disputes. Call scripts, um, this is also something that's new with um, the latest release. So when I'm doing a particular type of an activity within the software, maybe it's I'm making that introductory welcome call or maybe I'm managing a dispute, I can have procedure notes that actually have a call script to guide me through what I need to say. You know, it's very difficult to read from a call script, but if it's something I don't deal with all the time, I may want to have some guide to go to. Maybe it's a particular type of a dispute, or maybe I'm trying to onboard, you know, somebody new in the credit team. So call scripts are, are really, really useful there. Labor and cost concerns, we extend credit to sell more, not to create more work at the end of the sale, but this is often what happens. Why? The reason that um, we're incurring a lot more labor and cost is because our customers know we don't enforce our terms. Just by having um, a system in place to be able to go back and remind them, look, you know, you guys have been paying us 45 days on that 30 terms. That's not going to happen anymore. Okay, yeah, 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 you know, that's fine. We'll start paying on time. If you have a system in place and you start actually following this and you call them at day 31 and say, all right, we told you we're going to follow up. You need to pay us. You know, maybe they get to the point where you have to put them on credit hold. If you start enforcing the rules and your customers start to understand that you mean business on this, you're going to see your DSO fall. You're going to see cash flow increase. It's going to happen. Um, you know, your staff may not understand business credit, collections, cash flow, working capital. We work a lot of small companies. They have a part-time AR clerk. Um, they're really untrained. They don't understand financials. They don't understand the impact of the bottom line. You need them to be a part of this. You need them to have the training um, to be able to be impactful in this area of your business. You need to have standardized procedures. You need to stop using these disconnected systems, aging reports with highlighters, spreadsheets, email, accounting system. You need one place to go to with a lot of automation. And getting back to the credit policy we talked about earlier, you need to have responsibilities defined. Who owns what in the credit collections process? A lot of times we work with companies, they don't even think they have a problem, but they don't understand the rewards that come with automation. And we'll talk about that here in a little bit as well. We do have a few questions around how many people you should have in credit collections. We have a white paper we developed uh, to kind of help you out there. Uh, gives you some metrics maybe some ideas on um, you know, what your staffing might look like if you wanted to be more effective. A couple other points here just on the labor side. How much does it cost you to process um, a paper invoice? If you're doing 100 invoices a month, your labor costs are going to be maybe $3.67, kind of an industry stat. Your material and your postage, you know, your toner, your paper, your envelope, your stamp, um, all of that's going to run you, um, you know, fifty dollars for that batch, you know, hundred invoices. So you're looking at, um, you know, times twelve months, six hundred forty-four dollars for paper invoices. Probably not too bad. You get out if you're doing ten thousand invoices a month. You're looking at sixty-four thousand dollars annually. That's actually a low number. What if you could flip to a completely paperless invoice presentment with a system like Anytime Collect? You may still have some invoices you need to send out, but we can reduce that number significantly. 
The other thing that I want to point out here, this is a stat from uh, Paystream Advisors or an industry analyst group that monitors this uh, area of the, the enterprise market. Companies that use more of a manual, kind of a traditional way of, of managing credit collections spend only 20% of their time soliciting customers for payment. Companies using systems like Anytime Collect spend 62% of their time making calls, sending emails, and trying to get paid. That's 300% more time soliciting customers for payment. What could you do? What could your bottom line look like if you could realize that type of an efficiency? Uh, I'm running out of time here. We're going to blow through these last few slides. Uh, actions, we have rules engines. You basically set up the processes you want. You log in, and the system tells you what to do. Here's the customers that have broken promises you need to follow up on. Here's the customers that have invoices coming due that you need to, to uh, send a reminder out to, or we can do that automatically. Here's your first calls, your second calls, your third calls. Here's the customers that are um, have disputes that require additional attention or follow-up. All that information is organized for you in your action tab. Looks like I have some automation issues here with this slide, but we'll blow through it. Any email that could be sent out to customers, we can automate if you want it to happen. And we analyze the data. So if I have invoice A, invoice B, both have an uh, open balance. One was 30-day terms, one was 45-day terms. One was traded 28 days ago, one was 43 days ago. The commonality, they're both due in two days and they both have an open balance. We can have the system send out a reminder letter to the customers via email along with copies of those invoices automatically. And we can do that for literally tens of thousands of invoices in a matter of minutes. We can do that with past due notices. We can do it with statements. We can do it with all kinds of things, new customers that have been created with um, a copy of your credit policy or business credit app. All of that can be automated. Working capital, um, you need to understand the relationship between credit, late payments, cash flow, and working capital. You need to be diligent in your cash forecasting. Look at your expected payments, track broken promises and follow-ups, and use statistics to project cash receipts. This is also new in the, um, the 2015 release on your dashboard. We're going to look at your customers. We're going to look at the size of the invoice, and we're going to look at their statistics on how late they pay or what time frame it takes for them to pay on that invoice. So I might have a customer, and on a $10,000 invoice, they pay me on time at net 30. But if that invoice is $20,000, um, all of a sudden they're paying me 60 days late. We're taking that data, and based on that, we're giving you a projected cash forecast. Next seven days, cash receipts, 14 days, 21 days, 28 days, next 35 days. Should be pretty accurate. The other thing that we have, we've had this in the product for a while, expected payments. So you're talking to your customer. They say, I'll send you a check. It'll be for this amount. You'll get it you know, by the end of August. And they promise to pay. We can record that if they don't pay us. The system will mark it as a broken promise, put in the actual amount and the actual pay date. So lots of things we have to really manage cash flow and cash forecasting. Get it right. In most cases, it's your fault your customers don't pay you on time. Why? Because the invoice is difficult to understand. You send it too late for them to pay on time. You send it to the wrong person or the wrong address. The invoice detail is incorrect. Um, there's the wrong product, the wrong quantity, the wrong price, the wrong tax rate, the wrong freight, the wrong everything. We have a white paper. Um, might be of interest to you how to eliminate accounts receivable invoice disputes and get paid faster. Nine times out of ten, the reason you're not getting paid is your own fault. And those are things that we can easily remedy. We have the ability um, to identify an invoice as being in dispute. We can mark the amount in dispute. We can put a reason code on it, track it, get down to root cause analysis, and try, try to prevent that from ever happening again. Just an example here. Um, some statistics, about 60% of uh, invoice disputes are related to customers that required their purchase order to be on the invoice, but you didn't put it on it. We could set up a rule within our system that says that these customers require the PO on the invoice. We sync your data from your accounting system. We pull it in. We see that that invoice has a purchase order field that is blank. 
we create an alert, send it to your collector. Now they now know immediately that there's a potential payment issue because this customer requires the PO and it is missing. Getting real close to the end here, know when to fold them. You know, there are times when, you know, if this is your last ditch effort, you've done everything possible you can do, what do you do at the end? Call the customer and say, look, you know, I know we have this dispute, we haven't been worked out. Pay me half of it and we'll both go our own way. You know, something's better than nothing. Barter products or services, we've actually done now. We have, uh, you know, some customers that had some cash flow issues. You know, if they have something of value to you, why don't you barter it? You know, maybe they're a CRM consultant or maybe they have some product office furniture. They owe you 20000 go get $20,000 worth of office furniture from them. Um, allow them to return the unused product if there is some, right? And in some cases, you may even want to pay the return freight. Again, minimize your, your loss here. A lot of companies don't like to take a credit card, but if we're down to the end of the process, I'd rather take a credit card and let MasterCard, Visa, or Amex deal with this uh, deadbeat, and I'd rather get paid. So in some cases, the credit card fees are worth it. Um, set up payment plans, another option. Some other options here, send them to third-party collections, look at invoice factoring, involve legal, demand letters, litigation, or just write it off and move on. Another new feature, we've added payment plans. So you can take an invoice when the customer says, look, I can give you 50% now. Can I pay 10% uh, you know, five months after that? You know, five consecutive months, we can create a payment plan um, within the software, you know, and really down to the invoice level. We also have online bill pay, so you can enable your customers to click a link, go into a portal, see their invoices online, pay their invoices online. It's the same uh, capabilities that we extend to your credit collections team. So when I'm on the phone with the customer and they say, look, I don't have the cash, but if you'll take your credit card, I'll pay it right now, we can do that from within the software. There's a better way to manage business credit. I hope you guys all agree. just want to share a quote with you from one of our customers. They said that Anytime Collect is a much better system than the million dollar system they used before in the areas that it performs the same tasks. And we've got a lot of other happy customers out there. From a feature perspective, um, we've talked about a lot of things. What does Anytime Collect do? Automated email, mail merge templates, prioritized call lists, centralized information cash forecasting, dispute management, online payments, business intelligence, credit management, document management, and actually a whole lot more. Two more slides, I believe. Um, we mentioned a lot of resources. We actually have a whole lot more. So if you enjoyed the topic today, you want any of the copies of the white papers we mentioned, I will go ahead and send them out to you. We also have a resource center that has videos on uh, Anytime Collect. If you want to take a look at the product, See if it might be of interest to you. That has the links to the product brochures and the demos. Also has links to the white papers as well as customer success stories. And an hour and three minutes later, we've gotten through a lot of content. So my contact information is up on the screen. I'm going to turn it back over to Adrian for Q&A. Thank you, Jim, so much for that presentation. Uh, we do have a couple questions here. Uh, so is this being recorded? Yes, it is. We will, uh, Benjamin, thank you for your question. We will send you and everybody on the line today and everyone who registered the recording after the presentation along with Jim's contact information. And I do have a poll I'd like to launch while I'm asking these questions. Are you interested in learning more? If I could just have the audience answer this one question, that would be great. And um, Jim, what ERP systems did you say that this uh, works with? Is it um, Sage 100 ERP, Sage 500 ERP? That is the beautiful part of the product. So we do have, we have standard integrations that we have pre-built and pre-defined for most of the popular accounting and ERP systems. Uh, Sage 100, Sage 300, Sage 500, Sage 50 US. Um, we also integrate to uh, into a QuickBooks online or desktop. Um, Microsoft uh, Dynamics ERP solutions. Uh, we have inter interfaces there. Uh, Epicor. Um, 
Now, don't worry if you're using something I haven't mentioned yet. We have a generic uh, CSV flat file interface. We've used that to integrate to custom homegrown systems, solutions from Infor, Macola, and really just a, a ton of other applications, uh, SAP and Oracle on the high end. So if you can get data out of your accounting system, there's no doubt in my mind we can integrate uh, anytime collect with it. Still there, Adrian? I was muted. I was speaking, everybody, but you couldn't hear me because I had my line on mute. Um, I, I would just remind the audience that if you do have a question, go ahead and click on that question mark button and go ahead and key in your question. Um, or click on that raise your hand button and I can unmute your line and we can uh, speak live. Um, otherwise, I just want to thank everybody for joining us today. And Jim, that was a great presentation, a lot to cover in an hour. Thank you so much. Yep, I appreciate it. I wish I had another hour because I could have kept talking. <laughs> There's so much to talk about around this subject. It's very compelling and popular, and uh, every, it just seems like it's increasing in popularity. Uh, so thank you, everyone, for spending an hour with us. We really appreciate your time, and we will send you that follow-up email along with the recording. And if you do have any questions, go ahead and respond to my email or a member of Jim's team will definitely be in touch with you. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you, Adrian. All right. Thanks, Jim. Bye-bye, everybody. Have a good day. Bye-bye.